Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Game Devs of Color Expo 2022. I am one of your many talented hosts here today, the Purple Sharpie, but you can call me Sharpie if you're feeling especially secretive today. But it is no secret that I'm here with a very, very talented team from Dots Home. We have Christina, Evan, as well as Ryan here today. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thanks for having, Thanks us. For having us. Now, Evan, can you tell us a little bit more about this incredible game that is Dot's Home? Yeah, Dot's Home um, focuses on the main character of Dot, a young 20-something woman living in Detroit, um, living with her beloved grandmother. And uh, Dot, through a series of um, metaphysical kind of um, events, finds herself traveling back into the past and visiting different generations of her family as they are at crucial decision points trying to figure out where and how they can live. Um, so it's a game about race, place, and the search to, to find some place to call home. It's uh, also comments on, you know, the racist history of housing legislation and policies throughout the United States. So it's very much about like uh, the things that are happening now and how they're connected to the past. Awesome. Well, I think we have a trailer here. Let's go ahead and run it. After watching that trailer, I have to ask immediately, Christina, can you tell me why this game actually takes place inside of Detroit, Michigan? Yeah, a lot of the development team is from Detroit or has roots in Detroit. So one of the things about, about Detroit is that it's been in the news a lot over the past 50 years of the place of opportunity and then the place that everybody left. And it has, it's a microcosm of everything that's happening in housing today, where there's segregation, there's you know, white flight, there's disinvestment, and then there's predatory investment in Detroit. And it's all about the systems. We wanted to explore the systems and Detroit was the place to do it. But the important thing about the story overall is that it's the story about family living in Detroit, which you know, all of our development team cares deeply about, you know, telling the story in a tender way, because it's about systems that are really messed up. How do we tell it in a way that explores the real people in these issues? Now, speaking about people inside of not just these issues, but succinctly inside of this game, community is a really, really large motif inside of a lot of the conversations that we have inside of Dot's home. Evan, can you talk to me a little bit about why community is so important inside of this game? Yeah, you know, community is so important because, you know, where we, where we have the opportunity to live, whether it's renting an apartment, buying a home, some, some other kind of um, ownership or um, entitlement scheme, Community is where you where, where you plant those seeds, right? So the places that you feel safe, that your children feel safe, 
you know, and then the counter narratives that come from, you know, the overarching system under which we all live about who is supposed to be in what place, right? You know, who, uh, what the types of people that make other types of people feel unsafe. And if you're a black, brown, or marginalized person in the United States, you've seen these kind of mechanisms deployed against us, right? So it's like, oh, okay, on next door, somebody's talking about somebody suspicious um, has been lurking around the neighborhood. Well, why are they suspicious to you? You know, what profile do they conform to? And what profile do they not conform to? So you also see the same kind of thinking, you know, within the institutions that leverage the ability to buy or rent a home, right? So whether you can get a good credit score based on your background, your personal background, you know, also, um, you know, the prejudices of a lender or a real estate uh, broker who may not want to sh necessarily show you a place that that they think that you are not supposed to be or could, cannot afford. So there's a lot of assumptions and presuppositions that, that really control where people can go, even if they have the means. Um, there are still attitudes that that pr could prevent them from finding a place to call home. Now, yeah. on that, I'm oh, sorry. To, to add to that, I mean, this team really believes in the power of community. We wanted to talk about collectivism, about something that this country has abandoned long ago or maybe never even bought into is we work, we work together, we make the place we call home together. And when we start thinking about things individually, about our homes and neighborhoods individually, then you, we realize that we get into this like lizard brain state where we want to be really protective and that can tend to lead to violence and discrimination. So what we wanted to reinforce is this innate human desire to connect and be part of a community. And that's that's a huge theme in Dot's Home. Now, um, Christina, let me ask a little bit because there are moments integral inside of the story where community can either be... Um, I want to say further developed or completely abandoned several times in the story. And I won't spoil anything, but the player does get to make those decisions themselves inside of the game was how important is it to showcase exactly what happens coming from these decisions from the developer to the player's experience? Yeah. When we were talking about the story before we even decided it was going to be a video game, we talked about how important it is for us to convey the systems that cause us to be, to have a choice set made for us. We, you know, the world is not our oyster. We operate in, in this country and in this world in a box and there are certain pathways to get to various places. It's not an incredible thing that we can create. We are stuck with the choice set. That sounds familiar, right? It's a video game. Like the developer makes this choice set for the player and then they, you know, they decide what's best. And so we wanted to give the player this sense of agency and self-determination. That's kind of an illusion, um, which is what it's like in the real world in our housing system, where we we think we have real choice. We we talk about it all the time, but we we don't. And that's because of the, these like moments in time, individually and societally. Um, that have, have just like boxed us in. Yeah, I actually like how a lot of the uh, choices that you make in the game, while they affect the outcome of the game, a lot of them are very much community driven choices. They affect the community, they affect your family. It's like, it's important to realize that a lot of the choices that you can make in something in a situation like this don't really affect anyone besides you and your immediate community. And sometimes it can feel like they're they're affecting more than just that. And I think that I think that we do a good job in the game of making important choices feel powerful, but while also still just affecting you and your family and the way that you're like you grew up in the game. On that topic, I want to discuss choices and the power of having the right choice at the right time when not always presented with the right choices. So of course, I'm going to discuss the magical hallway component of the game here. Now, I understand that time travel doesn't always look like magic hallways. Evan, can you talk to me a little bit about the decision to create a time traveling magic hallway inside of this game? Well, you know, the decision to create the magic hallway is a tie to the fact that we wanted to explore 
how these policy these policies and this legislation happens generationally, right? So when we talk about something like redlining, for example, right? You talk that's you know the practice by which you know these organizations and sometimes governmental bodies would tell people where they could and couldn't live, right? You know, um, real estate organizations would would basically zone out areas that where they didn't want black people, you know. And during the early part of the 20th century, during the Great Migration, where masses of black people moved from the south to the north for a search of better lives, they they encountered redlining, right? So after redlining, there are other policies, right? Christina can speak um, uh, better to this, but we want to figure out a way fictionally to convey the idea that throughout time, um, people in Dot's family and really all other families across America have been faced with these same kind of decisions, you know, again, bordered by these policies and legislation that, that really gives them a limited choice set. Christina, you can talk a little bit more about the housing history, the housing policy stuff. I could, but I want to talk about the this sort of like narrative and creative decision to make a hallway. <laughs> and I mean, this game is very- Personally, it sounds like it was a vibe choice, right? Like it is, you walk yeah, into a cool hall, you open a door in your house, you walk through a hallway, you yeah. go, you find yourself somewhere else completely. I think a lot of the reason why we put that into the game was about the way that it felt. And I know that there's a lot of thought and a lot of decision-making that goes into like the, the deeper meaning behind a lot of things like this but sometimes it's all about like you know you're making a game you're making an art piece and a lot of it is just by like what would feel cool like the magic hallway was a very special location and it felt very transitional and we designed it that way intentionally now let's talk a little bit more about that design because i understand ryan your team weathered sweater um which primarily worked on the development on the back end used unity as an engine to achieve it there's a lot of integral, uh, I want to say, design choices inside of the magic hallway that you don't see in other aspects of the game. For one, uh, as as Dot's character actually moves through the hallway, you actively see multiple different mirrors inside of that same hallway reflecting the fact that she is actively moving as well. Talk to me about what that development cycle looked like inside of Unity. Well, it's actually really interesting because that is probably the only scene in the game that makes use of 3D in the entire game like most of the rest of the game is just perspective or like faked 2d or like you know background art layered on top of each other parallaxing we decided to use 3d in that room just to make it feel you know unique make it feel like you're in a different world we have the like mirror like i didn't actively design that space um neil so one of the, like the other co-lead dev like built that space in the original prototype of the game and I felt like we couldn't remove it because it was just such a good space that got made there. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to believe that the mirrors were introduced there to just show all the different perspectives that Dot is going to be considering throughout the game. Uh, can you also talk to me a little bit about the chat function inside of the game, which operates very, very simple and is very, very normative as per point and click adventures. Obviously, we have standard idle animations inside of the game for all of the characters, but the way that the, the text actually pops up, was that an intentional design choice as well? Yeah, I've always liked typewriter text. I got my start in like RPG Maker back in like 10, 12 years ago. <laughs> um, I did a lot of research into point and click games to see, to decide like how we wanted the text to be visually presented. We didn't want it to interrupt the actual actions going on on the screen. So we put it up in the top center. We made the choices front and center, like right in front of you so that you could consider them as they came up. Um, mainly though, I think the biggest decision about that was just how large we decided to make the text. Um, we, wanted it to, like before we even decided to bring it to mobile, it was a consideration, just making sure that everything would be legible and playable on mobile devices. So like we intentionally made it so that it would be usable on mobile. It wasn't so much a difficult technical implementation though behind the scenes, we are using like a custom skit system for all of the implementation of the cutscenes and whatnot. So they're all like text files and like anyone designer or programmer can go through and like implement a cutscene. 
Now, Christina, I want to talk to you very briefly here because as Ryan added, this game is obviously available on mobile in addition to any PC platforms as well. So it's available inside the, both the Google Play Store and the App Store right now. How important was it for you to make sure that this game avail was available on mobile? Yeah, we wanted this game to be, we have a, we have a guest who's joined us now. Um, we wanted, speaking of which, we wanted our audience to be young, maybe not this young, but we wanted our audience to be, you know, black and brown, people of color, people who know that this, this system has been rigged against them, and they know that, you know, they need some validation and some motivation to get involved and, and make some change, and so we wanted as many of those folks to play it as possible. So that's why it was so important for us to expand to mobile um, and to be to be where folks are. Also, this is a tool made by organizers. So we wanted organizers to be able to like go door knocking and say like, this reminds me of this game. And do you, you know, maybe your grandmother's story is like in this game, do you wanna check it out? And just to have it be a source of joy for organizers to use. And so for organizers who are door knocking and stuff and doing community town halls, we thought it would be a great tool for them. Yeah, I can actually talk to that a little bit as well. Because when I was brought on to the project, I don't even think mobile was being considered as an option at the time. Like we were still, like when I was brought on, it was like a PC game, it was a point and click. And I was like, no way, like this game has to be on mobile. Like you want it to be in front of as many people as possible. Like there's so many people that you can't reach if you have to go through Steam or Itch. So uh, <laughs> during the contracting process, I actually pushed pretty hard for mobile to make sure that it could get in front of a lot of people. And I think after a lot of discussion, it ended up being like, it just became like, it almost seemed like an obvious choice. Well, you know, I unfortunately didn't have an opportunity to play it on the mobile platform. I did play it on PC, but I had such a positive experience. If it's even an iota amount of as polished as the PC version is, I have no doubt in my mind that the mobile platform will be ever engaging and ever informative to a hopefully a much younger demographic than myself in the future. So I just want to thank you, Christina, Evan, and Ryan for spending some time with me today talking about Dots Home. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you so much. Shout out to all the other game developers of color out there. Yeah. Greatly appreciate it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to this amazing interview where we had an opportunity to talk about Dots Home. As a reminder, you can grab the game right now on Steam. Check out the link for more information, or you can grab it on your phone right now, as I am on the Google Play Store or the App Store. Well, we have even more interviews scheduled up and on the roster for today, stay tuned, you won't want to miss it.